welcome back to the first lecture in the series of lectures over the next week over the coming week uh, we have an odd situation here in the sense that the organizers are also participants in this and for that reason i request professor bala here the chair of the indigo to conduct the whole sessions throughout the week so that we can participate in the lectures and attend the lectures and not worry about logistics professor bala here So as Peter said, you know, uh, if you have any urgent clarifications to be needed, please uh, do not, uh, you know, uh, do, do interrupt. But if it's a long clarification which you want, it's better to do it over the radio. So I think, uh, you know, take the call so that we can make the best use of the time, and we can cover the course which we have planned by. <laughs> Okay, can, can you all hear me with this microphone? Good, okay. Let me just say quickly again how happy I am to be here and to now launch into the actual work of the school. Um, and uh, it's, it's my job in this hour to uh, give an overview of uh, what a gravitational wave is and how we detect them. Here's actually first an, an overview of my 10 lectures uh, through this week. Uh, so here we are right now, and later today I'll talk in more detail about uh, the interaction between gravity waves and gravity wave detector, detectors. And here's a preview of the various topics um, that we'll be discussing together this week. You can see it's a mixed bag. When, when I said in my introductory remarks that it's some basic physics principles and some basic engineering principles, I, I meant it as, as that mix. Why physicists have allowed engineers to claim control of feedback control systems is a terrible thing for the honor of physics, but it's a very good thing for the honor of engineering. Anyway, let's enjoy it together. Many of these other topics aren't dignified by being part of the regular physics curriculum, but we'll learn them uh, together. And we'll get on to gravity wave detectors pulled back together with all these parts uh, towards, towards the end of the session. If you look at the outline of Rana's topics, you'll find that rather closely um, they, they hit similar themes, except Rana's will be in more, uh, more in-depth, uh, more gauged toward current and, and future applications. And uh, I'm also going to be a participant. I want to learn some of the things that Ron is teaching that I don't know. And I know I need to learn a lot from Oliver as well. So we're all fellow students together here. OK. Um, in the remainder of this hour, I'd like to um, have us pause and consider what a gravitational wave is. Nice to know what we're looking for uh, before we set out to look for it. Whoops. A bit about. The sources of gravitational waves, both potential ones in the laboratory, why they don't work, why this is an astronomical experiment uh, as well as a physics experiment. At the top level, knowing that we'll look into it in much more depth throughout the week, what is a gravitational wave detector? detector and uh, to motivate the fact that this is a week-long school, I want to close with a few remarks about why this is so hard to do. OK, so to, to imagine what uh, a gravitational wave is, I want us to first imagine how we might do a measurement that would detect the presence of a wave. So let's conduct a thought experiment together. Let's imagine that we want to build some sort of generic wave detector. And at this level of description, I'm not yet going to specify what kind of wave we're looking for. If we want to look for a wave phenomenon, we might want to do it by setting up an array of test particles. And we would do that because we want to see whether some effect comes and disturbs this set of test particles. And if we can see that disturbance, then that's a way of detecting the presence of the wave. Now, to, to link with a topic that is part of the standard physics curriculum that I think everyone in this room will have encountered before. I want us to first say, let's make this a thought experiment level detector of electromagnetic waves to start. 
So let's assign to each of those test particles little objects that are free to move in response to a wave. Let's add some electric charge on each one. And now ask the question, what if an electromagnetic wave propagates into the plane of that set of test particles, into the plane of the screen? What do we expect will uh, be the result of, of an electromagnetic wave encountering this set of test particles? Think of the answer for yourself. Use the physics that you know. Here is one possible correct answer. If the electromagnetic wave was oriented with its electric field vector in uh, the vertical direction, then at some particular instant in the passage of that electromagnetic wave through this set of charged test particles, all of the test particles would be momentarily displaced upwards. If that wave continued to pass through and it were an oscillatory wave, as most electromagnetic waves that we know how to generate are, then at some later moment, all those charged particles would be, be displaced downward, then upwards, then downwards. And that is, in fact, the way we detect electro, uh, electromagnetic waves. Uh, um, when Helmholtz built the first electromagnetic wave detector that was designed and operated as such, he arranged for a conductor filled with movable test particles, namely electrons, to move back and forth in response to an electromagnetic, le electromagnetic wave. Um, I'm sorry, I should have said Heinrich Hertz. Um, when, when Hertz uh, made that first detector, uh, the test particles were, um, were electrons. Uh, they were free to move because they were in a conductor. They moved back and forth, and he was able to, uh, by means that we don't need to remind ourselves right now, but that should be part of everyone's detect um, the motion of, of those test particles. Okay, now with that as the warm-up, the reminder of physics that everyone in this room already knows, let's go back to this grid of test particles and let's say now I want to use, uh, now I want to build a gravitational wave detector. So let me first get rid of any imaginary charges that I had put on those objects because I don't want uh, any electromagnetic effects disturbing my instrument because I know enough about gravity waves to know that they're very weak effects. Better not have charges that can respond to much stronger electromagnetic waves. And I don't need charges on my test particles for gravity waves because any object that I make is gravitationally charged, right? Any object that I make is made of mass. And mass is the charge of gravity. So, good, it's simple. This is simpler than than electromagnetic wave detection. I don't need to apply charges, just need stuff. So let me have a grid of test particles that are free to move if a gravitational wave comes and propagates through this plane. That's what we saw for the electromagnetic case. Here is the pattern that will reveal the passage of a gravitational wave through uh, through a set of test particles. Looks different, right? Okay, It's not everything moving together as a body in one direction or another. Instead, it's this more interesting pattern. And let's try to pick out the pattern. So um, originally, uh, the original positions of the particles where they used to be, I've drawn boxes to remind you where they were. And now, the filled in black squares are where the particles have ended up. And look, in the x direction, everything to the right of the center has moved to the right. Everything to the left of the center has moved to the left. In the vertical direction, everything above the center has moved downward. Everything below has moved upwards. It's a pattern that you can call a quadrupolar strain distortion because quadrupolar referring to the symmetry that it's downwards to the right, upwards to the left. A strain because look at the fact that the length change of this small separation has changed, whoops, has changed by a small amount. The length of the larger baseline between this test mass and this one has changed by a larger amount. It's a 
fractional length change that is characteristic, a fractional separation change that is characteristic of the response of a set of test particles to a gravitational wave. So this is a transverse quadrupolar strain in ob test particles that only have the gravitational charge, namely mass. So the one other thing I'd like to do as a bit of setting up some language that uh, we use in this field. Yes. Yes, I'm taking it as a reference, right. And, and that's very good language. Um, the only thing that is well-defined and that is measurable, and I guess those things mean the same thing, is the, the pattern of relative separations. Um, so uh, the fact that I said that this thing in the middle didn't move is kind of an arbitrary coordinate choice that I'm making. What we'll be doing in terms of our measurement is say, comparing uh, what x lengths were before and after the arrival of a gravitational wave and what y lengths were and what they, how they change with respect to each other. Um, but there, there's no well-defined operational meaning to which particle does not move. And that's one of the big distinctions of this kind of wave from an electromagnetic wave because there was nothing that you could say sit, sat still in the electromagnetic case. They all went up, they all went down. Um, here I can say, all right, that one's fixed, but it's not, uh, it's not a, a very meaningful thing to say. Does, does that? Yes? The electromagnetic wave is a vector wave, yes. Is a tensor. But, but the meaning of those words is no more or no, no less than the difference in these patterns. Okay? Uh, see? Right, that's right. Um, the basic equation is the equation of geodesic deviation, which is the closest approximation to Newton's law in general relativity. So in, in, in the appropriate circumstances, and, and I normally live in those appropriate circumstances, the, the equation of geodesic deviation is the bridge to making general relativity look quasi-Newtonian. Um, and, and, it, and it works in, in, in almost every case that you care about. Okay, thanks for warming this up with, with good questions. Uh, I hope everyone else will, will feel free to, to follow the example as well. So this diagram is the same on the, as on the previous slide, but I have these different words. Transverse quadrupolar strain. Transverse because the effect, like an electromagnetic wave, is transverse to the direction of propagation. Quadrupolar is the XY pattern that we see there. Strain is the fact that what the wave does is make a certain amount of fractional length change. So larger separations initially lead to larger change in separation when the wave goes by. And so it's natural to define the amplitude of the wave with some measure of that fractional length separation. Now for reasons that I won't, don't want to mention now, but if someone reminds me in my second lecture, I'll point out where this factor of, why this factor of two historically came in. We characterize the amplitude of the wave by this scaled strain amplitude that we call little h and it's equal to two times the fractional separation change between any pair of test particles. That's the amplitude of the wave. So the units of the amplitude of a gravitational wave are dimensionless. Right. Okay, so let me complete uh, uh, the analogy I want us to make uh, between electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves with this comparison table. We've mentioned a lot of these things already. So the role of electric charge uh, in the gravity wave case is played by mass. The role of E and B fields as the thing we track and say is the wave amplitude is played by little h the shear strain scaled by that factor of two. Electromagnetic waves travel at C. 
gravitational waves travel at sea. Someone once asked me, why do gravity waves travel at the speed of light? I said, why does light bother to travel at the speed of gravitational waves? And that is only intended to be slightly a joke. Um, the, meaning, the meaning to the extent that there is behind that joke is that, as we'll see, gravity waves are a propagation. Of, if we want to speak in fancy general relativistic terms instead of experimentalist terms, I've just explained gravity waves in experimentalist terms. If we want to speak in fancy relativist terms, we'd say they're propagating distortions in the metric of space-time. C comes as the relationship between the dt and the dx's in the, in the metric. So it's naturally, it's the, it's the speed that's associated with the metric. Why does electromagnetic phenomena of use that same speed? I'll let other people explain that, okay? But it's really, this is the speed associated with the metric. So it is the speed of gravitational waves. The predictor of electromagnetic waves was Maxwell in 1867. Einstein in 1916 for gravitational waves. The person who detected with a dedicated experiment, of course, we all detect electromagnetic waves every day of our lives, but the person who built an actual laboratory experiment that piece by piece checked all of Maxwell's predictions was Hertz in 1886 through uh, 1891. He did it partly out of the thrill of the chase, but partly to get a very rich prize that was put up by the Prussian Academy of Sciences, but they put a time limit on the prize for the first person to prove that Maxwell's theory was correct, and Hertz never got the money, just the fame. And, you know, we say his, his name hundreds of times a day, right? So maybe that's better than the 500 marks or whatever the, the prize was. There's no, no entry here yet. Probably it will be advanced LIGO, advanced Virgo, LIGO, India, filled in here. Oops. Why no name? It's pretty obvious. Electromagnetic waves are so strong, we're all born with electromagnetic wave detectors. I'll remind everyone how weak the gravitational waves are that we're chasing. But, uh, but this, is, this is the tragic aspect, or maybe it's the noble aspect of this field how weak these things are, and yet how close we are to succeeding in, uh, in detecting them. All right, now let me say a bit about the sources of gravitational waves. I haven't prepared any slides about the sources of electromagnetic waves, but what are they? How do you make an electromagnetic wave in classical sense? Accelerating charges, and let's specifically think in, in um, um, multipole terms, time varying dipoles is the best way, right? It's the way it usually happens, okay? There are no such things as time varying gravitational dipoles because we only have one charge of the gravitation, one sign of the gravitational wave charge. So uh, conservation of momentum says you can't make a, a, a time varying or at least an accelerating uh, gravitational dipole. Um, but you can make a time, a, a time varying and accelerating mass quadrupole. And those are the prime sources of gravitational waves. And because I'm a poor experimentalist and I like to see pictures, I've drawn some pictures of some examples of systems with time varying quadrupoles. A pair of point masses or spherical masses that orbit around each other. This is maybe the most important case. Say a bit more about it later. Has an easy to calculate time varying uh, quadrupole moment. Here's another thing. Here's something that is distorted from a spherical shape first in an oblate distortion and then a prolate distortion. We know situations where this happens in nature. We'll be looking for those. Here is a non spherical uh, system that, because it's changing in size, even though not in in form factor has a time varying quadrupole moment as well. Any, any system of mass that does any of these things, or you can make up more, I may mention one or two more uh, in a moment, will in principle be a generator of gravitational waves. I happen to be especially partial 
to this first one for several reasons that I'll, I'll mention in a bit. Um, I sh yes. A single oscillating mass, if it oscillates the right way, can, um, can generate gravitational waves, but it has to do something interesting with its quadrupole moment. So it can't be spherically symmetric. Then, it, then, it can't, then no matter what you do to that sphere, so long as it stays spherical, it won't make a gravitational wave. But if it has a quadrupole moment, and then that quadrupole moment changes in any way, then, then that works, then it can be a source. So fixed shape but change in size or change in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the sign of the quadrupole moment, anything like that can work even though it's, uh, yes, Suresh. Mm -hmm. then, then, then there would be no, no emission of gravitational waves. So, um, I hope it's clear that I tried to draw this not as a sphere, but a flattened thing, something with an oblate distortion. If um, so the question was, is, is the weakness due to the fact that there's, there's, that you have to go to high order? That wouldn't be my first answer. Let me give you my first answer to that. Here is a mathematical statement of the relationship between the quadrupole moment and the gravity wave amplitude. And let's walk through this carefully uh, and slowly. This isn't a very interesting thing, but I just put it in to try to be careful. Because it's a wave phenomenon, we see something at the retarded time, you know, after the time it takes for the signal to get um, from the source to us. Other than that, you know, cross it off from, from your mind. Okay, this is the mass quadrupole moment defined down here, second time derivative. This is a, an analog of the electromagnetic Larmor formula that would have in, in this place the first time derivative of the electric dipole moment. Here it's the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment. We can see that H is a proper wave amplitude by noticing that there's a 1 over r here, where r is the distance between the source and the detector. Just as the electric field falls off like 1 over r, the strain amplitude in the wave falls off like 1 over r. Now I'll finally get to the answer to your question. Here is the reason gravity waves are so weak. This prefactor is horrible. Now, my theorist friends, I'm about to say something very gauche to a theorist. I'm going to talk about the size of a dimensionful quantity. G over C to the fourth. I don't care what units you use. G over C to the fourth is a small number. Okay. All right. That's the reason. So, to make up for the fact that G over C to the fourth is part of this formula, we either need to be very close to the source, or we need a humongous, a dramatically large second time derivative of a mass quadrupole moment. And so what we're going to do together in the next minute or two is try to see what are the prospects for making I double dot over R large enough to overcome G over C to the fourth. But before we do that, let me say something happy. I mean, this slide contains some very bad news, but there's also some very interesting happy news. And that is, there's an opportunity here to do some rather remarkable kind of astronomy that's of an entirely different flavor than electromagnetic astronomy gets to do in almost any case. That is, if we are able whoops, to resolve the time dependence of H of T, and we're making very great efforts to do just that, a time trace of H of T is in fact the time history of the quadrupole moment. Strictly speaking, it's second derivative. Okay. So we will learn about the actual macroscopic motions of whatever makes up that time varying quadrupole moment by recording the waveform. So it's carrying a tremendous amount of 
diagnostic information, astronomical information, physical information, whatever you want to call it. It tells the story of the process that generated the wave is encoded in the waveform. So long as you detect it with high enough signal to noise that you can see h of t on a graph, then you have seen i double dot of t. And it's only a bit of a stretch to turn that into a complete story of what was happening at the source. And that's not the way electromagnetic astronomy is usually done, right? Usually we see the superposition of many elementary particle accelerations that aren't phase coherent, and there's no phase story to, to learn, typically. Yes, Suresh? What happens if I hit a state? Will it just be motion What do we lose by dropping? What do we, all right. I'm using the word coherent specifically to mean that that we can, if we have h of t, all I have to do is change the vertical axis, and then I've got i double dot of t. So in other words, in order to make that, it has to be, it can't be a whole bunch of little masses that are all vibrating back and forth. It has to be some stuff that does something that if you could look, if you were close enough to look at it with your eye, you would see it all moving in a pattern. That's what I mean by the word coherent. So it's, it's, the sources we're going to have is one source, whereas for most of electromagnetic astronomy, what we see is um, you know, an Avogadro number of an Avogadro number of um, individual uh, electric dipole changes. Right? So this is a different regime of, um, of, of astronomy. Now, a radio transmitter is precisely an example of this. You have all of the electrons in the wire that goes up the middle of that radio tower are exercising a coherent motion in the same sense that I mean here. They're all moving as a body together. But in astronomy, that's very rare. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. All right, so I mentioned one of my great heroes, Heinrich Hertz. Um, and once you realize how the Maxwell theory was experimentally established, the immediate thing you should ask is, why don't we have a modern day Hertz build a Hertz experiment? And let's remember what Hertz did. In a room about this size, in one corner, he set up a, I think it was actually an electric quadrupole. It was an oscillating current in a coil. And at the other corner of the room, he had another coil that was almost a complete circuit, but left a tiny gap between two ends of the wire uh, that he could look at through a microscope and see if a spark jumped across the gap. And he closed the switch suddenly on the transmitter uh, to cause an, an oscillating current to flow in that one coil. And then over in the, in the other corner of the room, he looked through his uh, microscope and looked for a spark. And he found sparks and showed that if you oriented the, the coil the wrong way, the sparks went away because there was no uh, time varying flux through the, uh, through the coil. He moved, uh, he had reflectors to uh, set up standing waves to measure the wavelength to show that he was dealing with a phenomenon at speed c. It's beautiful. It's a classic thing. We should do it, except we can't. We can't do it because if you ask, you know, how big a set of masses could you move in a quadrupolar pattern? How fast? And, uh, and then what gravitational wave uh, amplitude would they generate? It's very depressing. So here was my example system. Two one-ton masses connected by a very rigid rod, two meters long, spun about uh, an, an axle that's put through the midline of that connecting bar at 1,000 rotations per second, and you figure out what the quadrupole moment's t second time derivative is. It's very simple to do. And then you say, OK, well, where should I put my detector? I want it to be close, but I can't put it as close as Hertz did. Hertz had microwave signals, so across a room this size was fine. But I have to be at least one wavelength from my source. Otherwise, I'm looking at near field effects. So let me make my R 300 kilometers, which is the wavelength associated with one kilohertz. And my H 
is 10 to the minus 38. Now, Ron and I are crazy. Ollie's crazy too, but we're not that crazy. If, if that's what we were looking for, we would all be home. And I would be shivering through a, a northeast winter instead of enjoying this very warm and balmy week with you all. Uh, this, this is not winter, let me tell you. Um, okay. There is a way out of this, but it's not a way that involves building a transmitter. Okay. I, I, I have never heard or conceived of anything that can move these numbers by you know, more than an order of magnitude or so. 10 to the minus 38 is hopeless, just hopeless. Yes? Correct. Well, a, as you say, there, there's, there's mass built into this. This is the, the mass quadrupole moment. Here, here it shows up in the, in the definition. This is the mass density in, yeah, in kilograms per cubic meter. So the, um, I, I did explicitly evaluate the, the, the mass. Okay. Now, here is the amazing thing. That if we look to naturally occurring astronomical systems, even though they are being astronomical systems are much farther away than 300 kilometers, that they are cosmologically distant, because the mass scales of astronomical things can be solar masses or more, it turns out that that makes such a big difference, the, the ratio of a solar mass to a kilogram outweighs the ratio uh, between the distance to the Virgo cluster of galaxies and the distance uh, uh, across, across MP state. Okay. And as a result, we can succeed if we recast our experiment as something that uses naturally occurring sources in nature, that is to say, is an astronomical observatory in addition to being a physics experiment. In a moment, I will, I will show you the numbers, but let's just first get the idea straight. So here is one of those example kinds of time-varying quadrupole moments. Now I'm going to explicitly say this is a binary star system. Let me be a little more specific. Instead of an ordinary main sequence star, or even a white dwarf, I want to think of these as either two neutron stars, or maybe two black holes, or maybe one of each. But first, let's take the neutron star case. We know these occur. The system of, uh, that was observed by uh, Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse uh, that was shown to be emitting gravitational waves is precisely of this form, except it's an early stage of the evolution of this kind of system uh, where the separation of the stars is so large that um, the orbital period is what? I f yeah, so, so uh, thousands of seconds, I think. Uh, now, that system is evolving. What Taylor and, and Hull saw was the period was, sh was shrinking. That is, the frequency was growing. That's a runaway process. Eventually, that same system becomes two neutron stars separated by just a few radii. At that point, we've got 1.4 solar masses and 1.4 solar masses orbiting each other on millisecond timescales. The last few orbits happen at about a millisecond per orbit. So I've got my kilohertz radiator, but I've got a kilohertz radiator with 1.4 solar masses on each end of my rod. And then I've got something that even though the nearest one of these things is going to be far away, I've got something that is in principle detectable. And I think it's no surprise to anyone who's been paying any attention to the history of the gravity wave field that the design for advanced LIGO was set with its sensitivity goal being to be sensitive enough so that at the distance we have to see out into space to encounter the nearest one of these that's going to occur in a month or a year. We nevertheless have the sensitivity to detect those signals. On the next slide, I'll show you the number. It's bad enough, although it's much, much bigger than 10 to the minus 38. 
while we're here looking at this diagram, I want to put in another plug for the black hole case. I happen to like neutron stars a lot, mainly because of this fact. But I would be much more excited to see black holes because the physics should be that much more clean and that much more beautifully connecting to just the fundamentals of general relativity. The black hole, or maybe the binary black hole, should be said to be the hydrogen atom of general relativity. All right? We should learn the spectrum of, of that system, and we will eventually. Um, and that will be cool, way cool, when we see it. But likely, well, the thing that I know, that I go to sleep at night knowing we're going to see within the next few years, is the neutron star binary case. Let's see if we can um, learn a little bit about the waveform. I'm going to try this out. This may or may not work. We were talking about um, Pulse and Taylor seeing a system with a very long period and is gradually evolving to shorter and shorter periods, higher and higher frequencies. At those higher frequencies, even though the orbital circumference is smaller, the um, uh, the, um, as things shrink, the, uh, uh, not only does the frequency go up, but the amplitude of the signal grows. And we get something uh, that we call a chirp, which maybe will get played by my speakers, but maybe is inaudible. Uh, if, if we can't do it now, I'll make sure we hear it either at another lecture or, or in, the, um, uh, in the laboratory. Right? We can put on headphones in the laboratory. And, and listen to this. The speakers in my laptop are pretty terrible. What you should see in this graph are, is a quasi-sinusoid whose amplitude is growing. That's pretty easy. It's harder to see on this scale that the frequency is getting higher until finally the last couple of orbits have this dramatic blip upwards. And then some interesting dynamics happens as the two stars crash into each other and form some endpoint system that's most likely a single black hole. There's a huge amount of physics encoded in this waveform. At one point, I said it's easy to calculate. That's a bit of a fib. Uh, people have devoted illustrious careers, Bala is one of them, to working out precisely what the waveform is. And we know it now in pretty exquisite detail. I think it doesn't do any disrespect to that great work to say at the early times it's easy to calculate. It just gets hard. When it gets interesting. Uh, but the, the, the principle, I think, is, is, is quite clear. Um, so, and, and you can see how this fulfills that statement that I made, that the gravity wave um, waveform, H of t, encodes the dynamics. You see, from the fact that H of t is increasing in frequency, growing in amplitude, you see that the orbits of the stars are getting faster and faster around each other and that some combination of their separation and their speed is growing quite rapidly. And you, would end up, you could know for a fact that you had seen a binary star system. You can work out the masses and everything else just from recording this waveform. So it's a rather remarkable bit of astrophysics. Yes, Winnie. Uh, that's, those beats are just an artifact of plotting. Yes, I'm sorry they're there. Um, um, we'll find a way later to display this better and, and to hear it. Well, let, 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 me, let me do my imitation. Everyone in this business has to learn to do this. The signal sounds like this. Okay. Something like that. We'll hear it more later. Okay, now finally away from my bad whistling and into a, into a, a number that sets, uh, sets the scale for this. So how can we estimate H that we might detect? Well, H is a dimensionless number. So one way to get to it is to say, I can think of that as a ratio of two dimensionful numbers, two lengths. I know I've got one explicit length in the denominator, the distance from the source to the detector. So is the dynamics of the system, it must be encoded in some other length that goes in the numerator of that ratio. And it turns out to be, to be true. 
the rest of the physics of the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of a binary star system gives an amplitude that is a combination of these three lengths, the Schwarzschild radius of star one times the Schwarzschild radius of star two. Those are where the masses of the two stars come in. Divided by, whoops, divided by the separation between the two stars. And this is the thing that's shrinking with time because it's in the denominator. The amplitude grows with time. And now we can now say, well, what's likely the strongest um, amplitude we're going to encounter? The last orbit, A, is going to be about the size of, well, maybe a few Schwarzschild radii. These are neutrons, if we're talking about neutron stars. If we're talking about black holes, we could say about a Schwarzschild radius. What's the Schwarzschild radius for uh, 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 a system of order, a solar mass? It's of order a kilometer. So we're talking about the ratio of a kilometer to the distance to the Virgo cluster, which is 10 to the 21 kilometers, if our source were in the Virgo cluster. That's a good first guess. Turns out to be not quite correct, but close enough. If our sources were in the Virgo cluster, we'd be looking at the ratio of one kilometer to 10 to the 21, or an amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. Is that good or bad? It's, it's good because it's much bigger than 10 to the minus 38. But it's bad. Right? It's, it, it is bad. But it's good. It's much better than 10 to the minus 38. Now, the tragedy of, or the great opportunity, think of it as you wish for LIGO India, is that if there were signals of 10 to the minus 21, initial LIGO would have found them. But that isn't where astronomers told us to look. They said, you really got to look beyond the Virgo cluster, about 10 times its distance. And so you got to look for 10 to the minus 22. That's what advanced LIGO and therefore LIGO India is going to be able to see. And that's why this is all going to work. And Rana will convince you that it's all going to work. OK, let me mention just a few uh, other sources that we will be looking for. And there are others still, but these are, are, are sort of our favorite second tier. Um, the dense core whose collapse at the center of a massive star triggers a type two supernova that eventually forms a neutron star, or maybe a black hole, has one of those strongly time-varying quadrupole moments that come from a single object that is somewhat out of round, that has some quadrupole moment to it, that evolves as the system collapses. Um, we know that happens at, well, we know supernovae happen all the time. We know the rate. What we don't know is how <laughs> large that quadrupole moment should be. That physics is still being worked out and it's unfortunately very interesting physics. So the predictions are, are, are not very secure. The consensus is that uh, these are likely to be substantially weaker signals than the neutron star binary signals and perhaps the, the black hole binary signals as well. But we look, we might be surprised because the physics is poorly known. A rotating neutron star that has a hill on it, a mountain, a mountain maybe this size, um, has a time varying quadrupole moment by virtue of the fact that the uh, neutron star is, is spinning on its axis. We don't know, we don't have very good estimates of how large those distortions ought to be. So this is also hard to predict when we're going to succeed to find signals from them. But that's a very distinctive steady tone, uh, sinusoid, uh, of gravitational waves that we look for all the time. Also, fluctuations in the space-time structure of the very early universe, Planck times or thereabouts, will leave behind a background of gravitational waves analogous in some respects to the cosmic microwave background, but much better, okay, because What's the epoch we observe when we look at the cosmic microwave background? Half a million years after the Big Bang. And everything interesting was over long ago. Whereas this is going to come from the Planck time. 
Wouldn't you much rather look at the Planck time than half a million years after the Big Bang? I would. So this would be ex exceptionally cool. The physics is not well known or the part of that physics that is well known gives somewhat discouraging um, uh, estimates of the amplitude, at least at the advanced LIGO level, but people are trying to see how to push, push farther because if we could see this, that would be the most amazing prize of all from, from gravity waves. How am I doing on time? Looks good. Okay, so uh, that's my material on sources. Now let's uh, talk about gravity wave detectors, uh, at least at the generic overview level. Uh, see what we need and finish up with how come it's so hard to do this. So it's no surprise we've been looking at sets of test masses from the beginning. So we'll do that. We need instrumentation to register those motions and it better be sensitive because those motions are going to be tiny fractional separation changes of a part in 10 to the 22. And we need to ensure that when those separations change between those test masses, that those separation changes happen because of a gravitational wave and not something boring that's stronger. So we need good isolation from other causes of motion. And here's the challenge, 10 to the minus 21. Really now we know it needs to be 10 to the minus 22. Here is the first mechanization of a gravity wave detector. This is a resonant mass detector or so-called Weber bar after its inventor, Joe, Joe Weber, who started putting these things together in the early 1960s. By the late 1960s, he was operating pairs of these kinds of detectors and making in interesting statements about them. Let's see how, how they can work. So first at the thought experiment level, a mass, another mass separated by a spring. Think of this as one of the test masses in that thought experiment diagram, this another. As the gravity wave goes by this apparatus, it will momentarily change their separation. And then if the gravity wave was oscillatory for a bit and then passed through, this system, because those masses are connected by a spring, is still oscillating and may oscillate for some time, especially if you arrange for there to be very little mechanical dissipation to damp away that oscillation. And then you're invited to say, OK, if a pair of masses connected by a spring in a resonant system was set into low amplitude oscillations. Could I find a way to nevertheless detect that those oscillations were happening? And there's a variety of ways you could imagine doing it. What Weber first did was, first of all, he made this system out of one large cylinder of aluminum. One end of the aluminum cylinder playing the role of this mass, the other end playing the role of this mass, and the middle part of the cylinder playing the role of the spring. That's the pre-freshman way of saying it. The, uh, the sophomore or junior level way of saying it is he observed the oscillations of the lowest longitudinal mode of vibration of that extended mass system. Yes, there is a time scale. And I was about to say it. Very good cue. Thank you. Um, for a... Uh, one ton or a few ton cylinder of aluminum that's between a meter and two meters in length. The resonant frequency is in the vicinity of a kilohertz, a little bit below. So this is a detector that's especially well suited for signals uh, with uh, frequencies of one kilohertz. But it, it, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be pure wave trains of a kilohertz. It just has to be a signal that has some signal power at a kilohertz. So various kinds of sharp impulses, as long as they're sharp enough, have some power at the resonant frequency. Yes? Yes. No, this is a quadrupole. It's not a dipole. But good question. Thank you for that. Because the gravitational charge of this end and that end is the same. OK, so this moves to the right. That moves to the left. There's no dipole moment that's changed. But if you evaluate instead the quadrupole moment, the changing length 
is a changing quadrupole moment. So, so this detector is a, is a mass quadrupole as well. All right, so what did Weber do? Around the midpoint of his cylinder, he glued a large number of uh, lead zirconium titanate piezoelectric transducers, hooked them all up to a sensitive amplifier, and said, do I, you know, what do I see for the fundamental mode frequency, and do I see any steps in amplitude or step function type changes in phase? He said he did. When other people built copies of the apparatus, they couldn't find it. It's for, for a tea break, we can tell the story. It's not suitable to tell from the stage of, uh, of a formal lecture, but we can tell the story. But his insight into how to make the detector was 100% right, even though his operating it as an observatory was not right. His, his followers did several things that Weber didn't have the energy to do. Uh, they first took this whole aluminum cylinder and cooled to liquid helium temperatures to reduce the steady state level of oscillation from, from thermal vibration in that mode. They also built much cleverer transducers than the PZTs that were glued around the midpoint. They built little accelerometers, very nice accelerometers, glued to the end of, of the bar. And then after the gravity wave goes by and the thing is vibrating, you have a resonant accelerometer that is tuned to give a big signal when the bar is vibrating in its fundamental mode. The best of these detectors got to sensitivities of around 10 to the minus 18. And that wasn't good enough. And, and they didn't see anything. About a kilohertz. I think Weber had things at 750 hertz or something like that. Um, Yes. Yeah, there were some there were some clever ideas and and the the clever ideas can work some but they they get you factors of a few beyond the naive thing. But to get to 100 hertz or 30 hertz is pretty hopeless. And there's there's other reasons why this technology didn't push to um to to lower frequencies as well, but it's it's mainly the the thing we're discussing that that there's a characteristic length scale governed by the speed of sound in that solid material. And you can only play with that a little bit by, by clever things. So now instead of having us pick out just two, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, um, that's a good question. So, and, and, and Weber answered it in his very first paper, and he got that answer from um, the person who answered decades of confusion about whether gravity waves were physical things. That person is Felix Pirani. He wrote two papers in 1956 where he showed how gravity waves appeared in the equation of geodesic deviation. And the equation of geodesic deviation, which I'm not going to embarrass myself and write down because I won't get it quite right, but it has things that look like second time derivative of a length defined by the separation between two freely falling masses on one side of an equal sign, and on the right-hand side, something that comes from the metric, some version of, 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 the, of the Riemann tensor. And that's like A equals F over M. So once you've evaluated, uh, so oh, I should have this in my head. Um, the, um, the effective force between, um, the effective force that, that is associated with H is like H double dot, um, and it grows with L. And um, what else do I need? Um, and some dimensionful constants to turn it into, into a force. But it's proportional to, uh, to h double dot times the separation between the two masses. That plays the role of a force on the right-hand side. 
um, that'll be equated to, um, yeah, to, to, right, okay, right, so, so, so you're right, I mean, but, but we're doing Newtonian physics, you're absolutely right, um, but, um, so you want floppy stuff, but remember the floppiness also comes into to the to the frequency at which you work. So so yeah, if if you had uh, material with a with a lower uh, a, a lower Young's modulus, you could look at lower frequencies. You would turn things into uh, bigger signals, but you don't know since you're waiting for a wave to come by from one source, which is the right thing to do anyway. So. I, your physics intuition is right, but I don't think it's, it was easy for Weber to, to, to tune this because too many things come, come together. Okay. Lots of things look obvious with hindsight. Um, you're surely right that the, that the, the, um, the gravitational dynamics are complicated by the fact that there are elastic forces in the problem. Okay? On the other hand, Weber put together his apparatus for a few tens of thousands of dollars and did it with a team of a couple people and did it in a couple years. Okay? So which is more obvious to build? Um, it's different kinds of obvious. Okay, now. If we're relativists, this is obvious, okay? But if we're experimental physicists, it's, it's, it's not. I claim that when Ray Weiss read Pirani's paper and invented the gravity wave interferometer, he was doing some experimental physics insight of an extremely high order, and that furthermore, it couldn't have been done more than a year or two before Ray Weiss did it. And I'll mention why in just a second, but let me just put that controversial claim out there. So, if we just look at these two test masses from the diagram, and everyone remember the diagram I'm talking about? It's this one. So, if we're just looking at two, we've invented a bar. If we look at three, we've invented an interferometer. But boy, here's a wonderful thing. Once I say I'm going to use free masses and not two ends of some stuff that need to be connected to each other by a spring, there's no reason for me to pick these three. I should pick those three. Or maybe those three. Okay? I'm, in principle, I'm free to do that. There's engineering constraints, but they're nowhere near as strict as the, the, the length of, of an elastic material that you need in a, in a bar. But there's a major problem, and this is why, I hate to say it this way, this is why I forgive Weber for inventing that horrible thing, okay, and um, have extra admiration for Weiss and the several other people who independently invented it, including Weber, by the way, um, because as soon as you do this, you run into the question, oh, okay, what is it that I measure? Weber said, okay, I can see something stretch. I can put a strain gauge on some solid material and see whether it's being strained. Um, or someone else said, I can see whether the end is accelerating with respect to inertial space with an accelerometer. But how do I measure these large distance separations? Well, the answer is obvious in hindsight. You make a Michelson interferometer, you send light signals between this pair and this pair and compare, but that's an extra level of complication that we're still working out all the complications to make it work well enough. Um, and, and it's, and it's non-obvious, but it has this remarkable advantage that you can make the lengths really large, kilometer scales. Here is the Michelson interferometer that we've been reinventing in our heads. One test mass, another test mass, a third test mass, so that we get the advantage of a shrinkage of this arm while we have a lengthening of this arm and a lengthening of this arm while we have a shrinking of this arm. Either sign of that effect gives 
a phase difference between the light and those two arms, which is something that a Michelson interferometer was designed to detect. And therefore, this makes it measurable and allows us to sense the relative motions of distant free masses. And it's the ability to make measurements between distant masses and to make them with high precision that makes this possible. Just a reminder of how this works as a transducer. Our input is differential length, dis, dif, uh, difference, differential length changes in those two arms. And by the time we're done with the physics of a Michelson interferometer, by the time we bring the light wave from the X arm back together with the light wave from the Y arm at the beam splitter and superpose them, they can either be in phase, in which case we see a bright light at that output port. They can be out of phase, we see a dark port, or something in between. So we have an apparatus that can, for very small relative changes in a east-west direction and a north-west separation, turn that into a brightness change that we can measure with a photodetector. So we've got a length difference to brightness transducer. Yes? We, we, we can do that too. The, the question will come to be with what precision we can measure those, those, difference, those, those distances. If we set up uh, something with interferometric sensitivity for, uh, for that uh, distance uh, measurement, then the extra baseline, except for one complication that I'll mention a little later, would win. However, if you ask yourself with what precision do we now routinely measure the Earth-Moon separation, it's a fantastic number by some means. It's a few centimeters. But that doesn't outweigh the fact that the, the, you know, the distance from the Earth to the moon is only um, 240,000 miles, right? Uh, it's too small, a baseline. There's other astronomical systems. There's space-based interferometers. You need to look at both um, a numerator of something that I'll show as well as the, the length and the denominator uh, before you see which actually wins out. Um, well, that's a, it's a good question. It's, it's the natural question to ask. Here is a picture of the best thing to date, or one of the several best things to date. Happens to be the, the version of it that is my favorite one to visit so far. Maybe LIGO India will be my favorite one in the future. This is the LIGO Observatory in Louisiana. Four kilometer arms. You can see the Y arm stretching off um, to the southwest. And here's the X arm to the northwest. A beam splitter lives here, a laser lives there, a photodetector lives there. But you see the scale of what this becomes when you want to take advantage of the fact that you can put those mirrors really far apart. It operated in the mid-2000s at a strain sensitivity of about 10 to the minus 21. And what's coming together now will get another factor of 10 more sensitive in a few years. There are several other interferometers in the same uh, in the same ballpark. Virgo is three kilometers, now also building an advanced version. It's going to be about as sensitive as advanced LIGO almost as soon. GEO is a key part of the LIGO scientific collaboration team and has a 600 meter interferometer doing really important work. In Japan, they're building a three kilometer underground cryogenic detector that's a pathfinder for future technology and will be a good gravity wave detector as well. And let's not forget LIGO India coming soon. This is a hard thing to do. My time is up. Let me just end with the inspiring statement that all of the challenges that Rana and I are going to be spending the rest of the week describing why this obvious thing of inventing an interferometer is really still hard, but how we will nevertheless overcome them within a few years. We are going to see gravity waves um, in this decade. Um, you'll leave this school this week knowing why, why we're confident that that's so. So let me turn this over now.
Oh, sure. Uh, yes. So you have 51 minutes, 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 51 minut